Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. This is the last panel of the China um, of the China Working Group in the EP conference. So thank you very much for staying with us to the very end. Today we have four papers. The topic of the panel today is is China capitalist? So that is a question I think a lot of people ask and already maybe have your own answer. Don't know if today's session will change your mind now. So um, we got four papers today. The first one is by Michael Roberts. Title is When Did China Became Capitalist? Second one is from Walter Dom. Is China Imperialist? A Marxist Theoretical Inquiry. The third paper is from Dick Lowe. The title is Revolutionary Accumulation, Modernization Pursuits and Socialist Aspiration in the 70 Year History of the PRC. The last paper is from Cheng Anfu and will be presented by Professor Liu Zixu. The title is China's Socialism is a Marxist Socialism with Elements of State Capitalism. Okay, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Michael. Michael, you're on mute. That's a good start. Um, <laughs> Again, I'll now go mean. straight to the screen. Uh, so, when did China become capitalist? Well, that's a bit of a tongue in a cheek title because that will become clear that uh, where my position uh, is on this particular question, whether become now or was. Uh, but let me start with what we mean by socialism. It seems to me that uh, socialism or stroke communism, uh, a distinction I don't think uh, is significant in the name, uh, what was the, is the view of uh, Marx and Engels and other uh, socialists that follow that view is the nature of communism or socialism. As, as we know, the Gotha program uh, critique spells out uh, in a simple way what the view of Marx and Engels was. But in, in all parts of uh, the works of both, uh, we get a, an expression and an explanation of socialism and communism. So socialism, if you like, is uh, to each according to its product. Communism at the highest stage of communism from each according to his product to each according to his need. But the point is that the surplus product produced by an economy uh, after deducting general costs of administration and meeting the communal satisfaction, the social satisfaction of, of social needs like schools, health services and so on, or for those who are unable to work, then the rest of the, the surplus will go for the means of consumption for it. And it will go to individual producers through a cooperative a communist society. So in the end of communism, there is no exchange, no production of commodities for exchange or for money or for profit. And eventually there is no state. So that we move to a society of abundance where people receive their needs. It's a harmonious uh, cooperation and there's real feed freedom to use their time uh, as human beings much more in the interests of developing uh, their sensibilities across the board. But of course, we are not in a socialist society. We're in a capitalist society. Is there a process of transition between a capitalist mode of production towards socialism or communism? Well, clearly there is. And then in the Marxist view, I'm going to outline just a few categories to help us uh, uh, discuss that in, in more analysis. The first thing is that capitalism is ended uh, when there's a loss of state power by uh, capital and its armed bodies of men, and we have what was called the dictatorship of the proletariat. What is the dictatorship of the proletariat? When Ingalls was asked, and he replied, well, I'll give you a straightforward example. It's the Paris Commune. It's the workers' councils taking uh, over state power, throwing out the capitalists from state power and establishing their own organs of state power. But a state power is not socialism, as we've seen uh, defined. It's only a trans uh, the first step towards socialism. The next step must be the common ownership of the bulk of the means of production and credit, so that in particular, uh, the new uh, worker state or uh, democracy can plan investment production rather than it being left to the market forces and the law of value. And that process of planning should bring about a high and rising level of technology and productivity of labor to reduce working hours and gradually end scarcity for social needs and the gradual replacement of commodity production with direct production for use. So there'll be then 
as we move towards socialism and communism, the gradual ending of wage labor and money, both as a means of exchange and a store of value, because value will increasingly be unnecessary. A progressing withering away of the state power of animals and a moving towards a society of, of human cooperation. In my view, those are the steps of a transitional economy. And then we can measure that uh, those steps against just where uh, countries or states are in relation to that. So let's just take the period before 1949. Was China capitalist in 1920 to 1949? Well, in my view, it, it was. It was mainly a peasant economy, uh, but it, uh, what uh, mode of production increasingly was dominated by the capitalist mode of production, production for profit by uh, landlords in the uh, areas. The peasants were on subsistence, but landlords increasingly playing a role of using agriculture for capitalist profit. And to some extent, there was a development of industry and commerce in the cities, uh, mainly financed by uh, foreign investment. But it was a failed capitalist state. It was uh, divided up, invaded and occupied, riven by warlords and imperialist intervention. Uh, it took the revolution of 1949 through the peasant-based uh, uh, army of the Communist Party coming from the countryside into the cities and the dis defeat both of the Japanese uh, occupation and also uh, in the Civil War, the defeat of the forces of nationalist uh, parties and so on and armies. And the capitalist state in that period was then demolished. Uh, the expropriation of landlords, capitalists and foreign investors took place. They fled to Taiwan. So what we got after 1949 was a state controlled by the communist pe people's army. Uh, landlords were expropriated. Capitalists lasted for a short period of time to some extent, and they still ex continue to exist, but on a small basis and foreign investment basis um, investors were expelled from the country. And the introduction of centralized planning similar to the Soviet model uh, in order to drive forward uh, the economy, raise technology and the productivity of labor. And actually central planning, uh, even under the zigzags and disasters of the Maoist regime was relatively successful. Here's a, a, an estimate of about average GDP growth rate for the Chinese economy after 1949 up until 1978 of 6.7 percent you can see it was quite fluctuating but that's the average effect and often it was in double digits for long periods of time except as we get towards the end uh, into the 1970s and there appears to be a sustained slowing growth uh, because of uh, the inability of the surplus to be increased sufficiently by just an indigenous uh, growth and accumulation from the existing uh, 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 assisting Chinese workforce and so on. And so we had this new reform that took place after Deng in 1978 uh, and onwards, where we introduced much more the role of markets into the economy. Foreign investment is allowed to come in under strict limitations. Capital controls are maintained. Uh, industrial zones are set up to allow foreign investors and other capitalist uh, combines to begin. There's an end to central planning, but there's still indicative planning. There are still targets set at a macro level for which both the state and the capitalist sector are supposed to uh, play a role in achieving. So if you want to talk about it, we can talk about the period after 1978 as a long term or similar to the uh, Russia's new economic policy in the 1920s, uh, which was introduced after the period of war communism. But uh, the difference being that this is now a much more widened development for the market and also not based any longer on central planning, but more on indicative planning, but without letting the capitalist class get hegemonic control over the state. And if we look at the figures at the end of this period, as right up to virtually now, we can see that there's a dramatic difference in the nature of the uh, Chinese economy in terms of its relationship between the public sector and the private sector. This is IMF figures, uh, which, we, which are continually being updated, but are very relevant. I see if I can draw them out for you. If you take the zigzag line, that's the amount of public stock, public sector stock as a, as a percentage of GDP in China. So that's 1.5% higher than the GDP of China is the public stock. No other major country, uh, whether peers like India or the advanced capitalist economies have anything like that level of public sector stock to GDP. Then if you want to take the, the central one here, you've got the relationship, the relative position of public sector stock 
to private sector stock in China. So it's nearly three times higher the public sector stock than private sector stock uh, in uh, China. There's nothing like that in any other country, the capitalist uh, country or imperialist country uh, as well. And then on, on the right-hand scale, the level of investment from the public sector as a percent of GDP in China is, is over 16%. No other country has got anything like that uh, level of uh, investment from the public sector. It's usually about three to 4% as that right hand graph shows. Uh, and in leaving aside just the state sector and its size, but also let's look at the whole uh, relationship between the state, uh, the Communist Party and the private sector. State uh, ent owned enterprises account for majority investments in most major sectors and for 40% of China's GDP and 45% of no agricultural GDP. And the state sector makes up a substantial part of the national economy, roughly 30% of all secondary and ter tertiary assets, or over 50% of industrial assets. And the average size of a state enterprise is way bigger than the private sector on the whole, on average, over 13 times higher than uh, private sector companies in, in China. 95 out of the top 100 firms and eight out of the top 10 internet firms have a de facto controller who is currently a former member of the a central or local CP and nearly over two thirds of China's private companies have party representatives on their board and 70% of foreign enterprises do. So that's a very strict uh, control of what these uh, companies are doing although they're in the private sector. And the CP organization department now manages all senior promotions in banks, regulators, government ministries, agencies, the state enterprises and even many non-state enterprises. And of the 115 top companies in the world that are Chinese, 115 out of 500, all but four are state-owned, which shows the strength of the state sector and its ability to direct what happens in the economy and therefore uh, uh, direct also the level of investment and growth in the economy. So if China's capitalists since Deng or some other time afterwards, we are expected to be suffering from the crisis of capitalism, both in profitability and its ability to invest uh, on the basis of the capitalist sector. But if you look at this very latest figure that's been presented here, you can see from the World Bank that if you just take the period from 95 to uh, 1995 to 1919, the cumulative change in GDP per capita in current dollars in, in China is 432%. Nobody else has got anything like that growth in GDP per capita in the last the 25 years. Uh, not even the, the most the fastest, faster growing uh, East Asian economies. And since 19, uh, since the end of the Great Recession, it's still 150%, 7% growth in current dollars per capita. Nobody, nobody has got anything like that uh, in to match that figure. So if China's capitalist, it's a very, very unique form of capitalism that doesn't seem to appear anywhere else in the world in the current climate. Compared to say India, which is the, another big population country, which is regarded as a possible success story for capitalist growth, it's nowhere as a percentage of US GDP per capita to compared to China. And what about recessions? If, if China is capitalist, there should be regular and recurring recessions as there are in all the other capitalist economies and have been uh, since if you want to take it in this figure from 1974. So I looked at the recessions, the overall fall in GDP in those particular recession periods for the, for the capitalist world. And you can see in the, in the OECD countries, I think that's right, because I'm blocking myself out here. Uh, um, you've got basically no growth, or tiny growth in those recessions periods globally, or a big drop in growth. In the case of China, in every period of that recession, there is growth and significant growth and relatively much faster growth than we've seen in the other countries. And just take the latest position on COVID. This is a figure from UNCTAD only yesterday. It shows that in the period of the last two years during COVID, the slump in each of the individual economies around the world, all these uh, G7 economies, and then there's a few up here have done a little bit better, like Korea and so on. The world average over two years is 1.6%. But China has increased its uh, uh, real income growth, real income growth in the last two years during COVID by nearly 11%. Nobody can match that. 
But the, this, what is going on in China if it's a capitalist economy? Because all the evidence would suggest that there's something different going on than being a capitalist economy. In my view, capital, uh, China is not a capitalist economy. It's in that transitional phase, which we, I talked about at the beginning of this presentation, but it's trapped because it's isolated, it's surrounded, it doesn't have the ability to pr progress the productive forces indefinitely, and it faces a battle between the law of value and the market within China and outside. And if we can see that the, if we look at the private sector here on the left, we can see that just as you expect in all the other capitalist economies, the profitability of the private sector capital in China is in a, in a secular decline, and it therefore raises a real danger that it becomes dominant in the economy, it will actually start to cause the sort of crisis we see under capitalism. The right hand graph shows you the increase in the private sector's uh, share of the investment stock to GDP against the public sector. The ratio is rising all the time. So the private sector is gaining uh, strength as a, as a force for the law of value and profitability, and that raises the real danger for China, so economic prosperity in the future. In summary, what is China? In my view, it's not capitalism, but it's not socialism. It's in this transitional period. The law of value still operates in uh, China, of course, not just in trade, but also uh, domestically, wage labor is operating, a capitalist sector is operating to sell goods on the market, uh, workers are exploited, but there are two modes of production here. There's the state owned, planning mechanism, and then there is the uh, capitalist sector working uh, to produce for profit and to sell goods on the market. But while they coexist, they're also antagonistic. This is a dialectical process, the planning mechanism versus the law of value and production for exchange. That is a situation which cannot continue indefinitely, although you could say it has now continued for 70 years. I have a little duckbill platypus down here, just to remind guys to use uh, Engels as an example, the duckbill platypus is a mammal. It lays, it suckles its young, but it lays eggs. So it's also a reptile. It's both. It's in trans. It's in, in the evolutionary process. There's a transition from reptilia to mammalia, and the black, the duckbill platypus could be result, uh, considered a transitional uh, process in that. In the same way, I think China is not capitalist, and certainly not imperialist because Empirically, we can show that, uh, and it's not socialist though. But is it socialism with Chinese characteristics, as Deng and Xi say, or is it capitalism with Chinese characteristics, as Branko Lomanovich says, and many other Western experts? I don't think it's either. It's a transitional economy trapped. Which way to go depends on two things. Either the law of value must be reduced internally and externally, perhaps with workers' democracy and the development of the plan, and ending imperialism internationally, all capitalism face, all capitalism could rest, return to China as it did in Russia. Why does any of this matter? Final, final slide. For me, it matters because we want to show to the world's working class and to everybody that the way out of this crisis that capitalism's got depends on the superiority of moving towards a planned economy, abolishing commodity exchange and production for profit. So if an economy that is applying through the dominance of the state sector and investment and uh, the, using the planning mechanism in a powerful way can succeed, and China has shown that to be the case, then that's a, a, a powerful model for other economies and for working people around the world. And also, China avoids recessions. I mean, we face yet another one. We've just gone through one, uh, one now. We will have one before the end of this decade, in my view, if capitalism is to repeat what it always does. Uh, but in that case of China, that won't be the case. So we have an, also another key question is that th this model is something exactly what frightens imperialism in general, the growth of the Chinese economy, it's uh, op uh, uh, option of a different model to how you proceed. And that confrontation therefore is going to increase between US and the imperialist in bloc uh, in order to try not to anymore to engage with China, but to contain it, curb it, to drive it down and perhaps reverse its process into capitalism. That's going to be the big geopolitical economic issue of the 21st century. Thank you very much, Michael. We went through everything on time. Thank you very much. Right. And well, I'm just trying to get rid of my share now. Uh, yes. 
Okay, I will pass it over to Walter. Uh, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, even though the title of this panel is, is China Capitalist, my topic that I submitted to the organizers is, is China Imperialist. And to my mind, um, saying that China is imperialist assumes that it's capitalist, but I have to address the imperialism question as advertised, and I'll try to say what I can about why I think it's capitalist subsequently. So in the past several decades, China has undergone tremendous changes. It has become a major economic power, and it's the new workshop of the world. It has also increasingly asserted its economic and military power internationally. As a consequence, many observers claim that China has become a growing threat to the predominant United States and a potential rival superpower. On the left, this latter claim takes the form of saying that China has become an imperialist country. And this is not just a theoretical question. There's growing new Cold War driven by both Republican and Democratic US, US administrations through both threats and actual actions. So the socialist left has to have as much clarity on the question as possible. Now, many leftists claim that China is imperialist, and many of those claims are made without any serious theoretical argument. Its economy is so huge, how can it not be imperialist, is the method. Others try to, I would say, shoehorn China into what they believe is Lenin's definition of imperialism. But I think Lenin has no such fixed formula, and you can't really do that. In any case, let me just... In any case, the question is more complex. China exhibits characteristics of both an imperialist country and, let us say, an imperialized country, a victim of imperialism. It behaves like an imperialist power or a would-be one in many ways. It suppresses the rights of minority peoples within its borders. It bullies its neighbors in the South China Sea, in the South China Sea region, rather than allying with them to resist imperialist domination. It exports capital across the world to Southeast Asia, Central Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And its relations with developing economies on balance is that it extracts surplus value from them. Its military buildup challenges the US in the nearby seas as it seeks to be recognized as a full member of the imperialist club. But on the other hand, China overall, in other respects, does not look like an imperialist country. First of all, it's not a wealthy country, despite its total GDP and its many wealthy capitalists and politicians. Its GDP per capita is of the same order as Thailand or Montenegro. They, and these are not imperialist powers. Imperialist capitalists, as well as Chinese capitalists, have profited off China's low wages and its repression of labor rights and its lax environmental regulations. Importantly, a key characteristic of imperialist countries is that they share in the domination and exploitation of the rest of the world. Typically, this means that on balance, they import more surplus value produced by workers of other countries than they yield to capitalists ab abroad. They are more exploiter than exploited. And China does not fit this pattern. Overall, it's more exploited than exploiting. It yields more surplus value than it gains from its investments abroad. And I just noticed that Min Shi Li has recently published calculations to that effect in a recent issue of Monthly Review magazine. Further, China's foreign investments do not bring at the high rates of profit that imperialists extract. China's growth and wealth depend on the super exploitation of its own proletariat, not of others. Hundreds of millions of migrant workers are a major source of the surplus value that China produces and exports. In the cities where they work, under the Hugo system, they are denied the health care ha rights, housing rights, and education rights that ena enable the working class to reproduce its labor power. The inability to reproduce its labor power through wages is the definition of super exploitation. And that's certainly the reason why imperialist capitalists have turned to China for so much of their production. The Chinese industrial working class regularly engages in protests, strikes, and other forms of struggle. And it has raised its wage level to something like 10 or 20 percent of average wages in the West. But China's ruling class, I believe, cannot afford to allow its workers to improve their living standards much further. 
Again, that's because China's internal labor exploitation is what has brought about its extraordinary economic gains. And the Chinese ruling class can't afford to see that, that changed. To continue and expand its role as workshop of the world, China needs unimpeded access to raw materials from every corner and to the shipping lanes and other transit routes for importing the materials it uses and exporting the goods it produces. So it necessarily seeks to expand and defend those sources and routes. It acts in an assertive and often aggressive fashion. That is, it acts like an imperialist power in defending its interests. But while it seeks to move up the value chain, China's interests include continuing its workshop role, which serves to maintain the imperialist structure of the world and therefore its own intermediate status as on balance an exploited country. I'd like to raise the question of whether China is sub-imperialist. In the classical Marxist theories of imperialism a century ago, by Luxembourg, Lenin, Bukharin, and others, the world was relatively easily divided into oppressor imperialists, countries, and oppressed countries. But there were exceptional cases. Tsarist Russia was universally regarded as imperialist, even though it was probably not a net importer of surplus value. Today, China, like a few other countries, exhibits characteristics of both imperialist and imperialized countries. So the classical analysis has to be built upon and extended. One advance that has been made is the theory of sub-imperialism, which was originated by Rui Mauro Marini in Latin America in the 1970s. He analyzed Brazil at that time as sub-imperialist, meaning that although it was economically and geopolitically subordinate to imperialism on a world scale, on the, in, the low, in the regional scale, it dominated weaker countries, extracting surplus value from them, at which it then shared with the imperialists. Marini's an analysis of Brazil has been extended by others, including Patrick Bond, to South Africa and other countries. And some say it applies to all the BRICS countries. But in my view, it doesn't fit for Russia, which I think because of its geopolitical role should be seen as imperialist, as Tsarist Russia was. And it's an unconvincing analysis of Fritz China. Let's look at that. At, for, for, at, at one glance, it may seem plausible to regard China as a sub-imperialist country in Marini's sense. Its economy is still technologically subordinate to imperialism. Arguably, its oppression of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, which now includes the use of forced labor in factories serving imperialist capital, looks like the sub-imperialist behavior that Marini described. China acts as a local imperialist in the service of imperialist profits. But on the other hand, China's economic reach is far more global than regional and it can stand up to imperialism in ways that most oppressed countries cannot, even the strongest. Some students of Marini uh, have argued that China's economic relations to Brazil and to South Africa, which are the model sub-imperialist sub countries, that China's relation to them is that of an imperialist exploiter. China's manufacturing uh, output underprices other dependent countries and reduces their manufacturing, leaving them to depend on raw material export. Uh, these, considera these considerations, I think, make it problematic to apply the same, the sub-imperialist label to China. So uh, I would summarize by saying China cannot be shoehorned into traditional Marxist categories. It's a capitalist country with imperialist aspects and aspirations perhaps best labeled as semi-imperialist or quasi-imperialist. Like any capitalist country, China is driven by class struggle and by competition, um, including international competition, to act increasing like an imperialist power. And one aspect is that it's driven to upgrade technologically. There's a, a long way to go. China may produce the most automobiles and almost all smartphones, but Western capitalists capture most of the profits because of their monopoly of technical knowledge. China may seek to advance its role to become not just the world's workshop, but also a high-tech leader, but it's far behind in high-tech innovation. It has little presence at the top of the global supply chain, which dominate industrial production today. And holding China back in this regard is a key aim of the stepped up Cold War that the United States is waging. Some say that China is not yet imperialist, but is becoming so. 
so the Chinese capital may seek to seek to restore higher levels of profit by moving profit to lower wage countries and exploiting workers there at a higher rate than it can at home. And it has to consider doing so because Chinese workers' wages are rising. A bonus in doing that would be to undercut the class struggle and the, wage and the rising wages at home. But it's impossible for Chinese capital to find hundreds of millions of cheaper workers elsewhere. India is the only country with an equally large population, but it lacks the trained workforce and the modern infra infrastructure of China. Other countries like Vietnam and Bangladesh, where China is looking to uh, export some capital, they're too small to replace the huge Chinese working class. So Chinese capital remains dependent on super exploiting its own workers. Um, I want to say something about this new Cold War that's rising up between the US and China. As I've said, a key driver of that is that the US wants to defend its intellectual property rights by keeping advanced technology out of Ch China's hands. Witness Trump's sanctions, his arrests of, of Chinese executive, executives, policies continued by Biden. The common imperialist aim is to maintain imperialist control over the globalized economy. Now, socialists do not defend imperialist monopolies or prerogatives, including their intellectual property rights. And just as with the, the corona, coronavirus vaccines, intellectual and, pro, and productive advances should be not kept in the capitalist hands or imperialist hands, but should be made available to all. At times, the, the imperialists claim to defend democratic rights and the rights of the nationally oppressed. Their proclaimed sympathies for the, sympathies for the rights of China's neighbors in the South China Sea, for example, are thoroughly hypocritical, as is their championing championing of the oppressed Uyghurs, for example, from whose exploitation they benefit. That said, imperialist hypocrisy does not prevent socialists from supporting various struggles which are opposed by the Chinese ruling class, struggles by workers against capitalists in China, struggles of oppressed people's right to, self -de na to national self-determination, struggles for the national rights of Chinese neighbors. So when China acts imperialistically, in opposing these struggles, socialists stand opposed to it. When China, or rather the Chinese government, is defending itself against imperialist prerogatives, socialists side against the imperialist. These are just a few possibilities illustrating the complex situation presented by China's quasi-imperialist role in, in the world. Now, I wonder, um, Sam Key, how much time I have left to address the capitalist question. Okay, you can wrap up. Can you in three minutes? Three okay, minutes. I, I, yes. So, so let me speak briefly to that. Um, first of all, raising the question to raise the question: Is China socialist? Michael Roberts uh, argued that socialism for Marx meant the lower stage of communism. I would point out that's uh, yes, that, that that was true for Marx. It's uh, sorry for Lenin. Um, from Marx, sometimes he used the word socialism to refer to the worker state transitional to communism. So, but either way, socialism means either the working class in power or the working class has achieved communism and abolished all classes. And that is not what, uh, that is not in any way true of China. Of course, the official Chinese government's view that China is socialist with Chinese characteristics um, something like that is also the standard popular interpretation of socialism, which is shared by many on the on the left, as well as uh, capitalist politicians and journalists, namely that a socialist country is one with a predominant state sector in the economy. And by this standard, China is indeed socialist, but that's not a Marxist uh, standard. So um, I certainly would argue that China is not socialist in any Marxist way. And then uh, to argue that it's capitalist is a much more um, uh, complex uh, argument to make, but I would say the key property of any class society is which class produces the surplus and which class extracts the surplus. In China, the surplus is predominantly produced by the proletariat. And where does that surplus go? It goes to the capitalists, it goes to the state bureaucrats, and of course, there's a great deal of overlap between them. The, uh, the Communist Party is uh, 
includes capitalists, it also includes workers, but it's dominated by capitalists. It's dominated by billionaires or relatives of, of billionaires. It's not a working class party in its composition. It's not a working class party in that it suppresses workers' rights. It does not allow workers to organize independently and it does allow capitalists to organize in, independently. The Chinese Communist Party is a, uh, a hybrid of a state, uh, the, China, the Chinese system is a hybrid of state capitalism and private state capitalism, and uh, it's not socialist. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Walter. Um, I will um, pass it over to Dick now. Bear with me for a second share the screen. Uh, yes, okay, can, can, can you see it? Yeah. Yes. And can you hear me? Right. Yeah. Okay, so um, now uh, you can see uh, it's a quite clumsy topic. Right? And that because I, what I want to do is in a sense to give a presentation in the spirit of what I call historic, uh, historicizing theories as opposed to theorizing histories. Right. So what precisely is about this? That um, the, this uh, presentations, I want to attempt uh, to formulate a conception for making sense of China's political economic transformation over the long history of the PRC right, over the past 70 years or so. Now it's the, the, its main motivation is always the question that do non-Western societies have the luxury of constructing socialism? Now, subjectively, Western societies typically want to have development as the primary objective because development is really the means for survival, think in terms of what happened to China in the first half of the 20th century, right, that the introduction of socialism into China has always right, in the first place viewed as the, uh, the means for the survival of the nation and the country and the civilization. And socialism is rather in a sense, a luxury right, that is subjective and objectively non-Western societies cannot construct socialism without development. But development is always difficult. And they, it can, always, can often have tension with the attempts of socialist constructions. And that is why we can see that from time to time, there have been conflicts between the two different pursuits that and this has been the driving force uh, that uh, driving the, the, the dynamics, driving the evolution of Chinese history, rather than, as opposed to end the activism of the, any all powerful mastermind in driving, in driving the evolution of Chinese history. Now to fix these ideas, let me go to the more concrete levels but before getting back to talk about socialism or capitalism. Now, the background is that worldwide, late development is always difficult. It is not at all easy, natural, normal. Now, just a very quick indication here, post-war era, you can see that the performance of the rest of the developing world outside China has been quite dismal relative to the advanced countries. So there is not at all any sign of convergence as promised by mainstream social science, right? the neoclassical economics or the theories of modernization in political studies or sociology. And this is particularly the case entering the era of globalization. Right? Now, in contrast, China has been able to sustain rapid economic growth and acceleration of growth in the era of globalization. Now, if China is capitalist, that implies that it's really promising to have the capitalist path of modernization, given the size of the Chinese population and the Chinese economy 
in the context of the developing world as a whole. Now, the, back to the China itself, right, that from the very beginning of the founding of the People's Republic, the notion of socialist industrialization right, has been used to link up the two different pursuits. And this implies that first, for modernizations, socialist industrialization is expected to promote overall economic developments. And at the same time, it's also expected to expand the working class, both quantitatively and qualitatively as the masters of the societies. But then as we can see in the events, the modernization pursuits seem to have been achieved quite successfully. But just a quick indication of the labor productivity of industry relative to non-industry. Look at the curve in red. It's expressed in the constant prices. And you can see that the general chain was the upward movements, meaning the much faster pace of growth of industrial productivity. And then this growth has been, the, the gains have been transferred into the non-industrial sector because of the falling terms of trade of industrial goods relative to non-industrial industrial goods. You can see the gap between the two curves. The curve in blue is the relative productivity in current prices. So the, the, the strategy of promoting industrialization for the purpose of leading overall economic development seems to be quite successful. Of course, we know that the immediate cause of productivity growth is always productive investment. And again, you can see the sharp contrast between China and the rest of the developing world, right? that China witnessed the acceleration of the investment rate as opposed to the decline in the investment rate in the developing world and indeed in the rest of the world in the era of globalization. Because by the way, the defining characteristic of globalization is financialization, the rising predominance of speculative finance in the world economy, which results in the crowding out of productive investment. And China is really exceptional in this world context. Now, the, just to give you a, another quick indication of the path of development in China or the evolution of the path of development in terms of the incremental capital output ratio. And you can see that it was basically a very steep upward movement up until the mid 1970s. And thereafter, it exhibits very much a kind of u shaped Now, capital deepening industrialization, that is the upward movement of this curve, that's the in economics is associated with the famous FMD models, Fetterman, the Soviet Center five-year plan, Mahalanobis, Indian five-year plan, Doma, the American economist that formalized these Soviet and Indian uh, strategies. Now, the, <clears throat> these were actually quite common across the developing world in the era of the golden age of capitalism that is before neoliberal globalization. What is peculiar to China and other Soviet type economies was to pursue these strategies within the framework of state planning and public ownership. Now in terms of public ownership, you can see the black that before the market reform, that is before 1978, there was a sharp rise from 42% the beginning, rising to 78% state ownership in industry, and the remainder being taken up by collectively owned enterprises, rural enterprises, anyway. So 100% public ownership by the year 1978. Thereafter, it underwent continuous declines. Now, this is the gross value of our industry output. If it's measured in the value added, then the ratio is 
again, 78% in the year 1978, and nowadays about 30%. Right? So now in the meantime, the, the, the same trend of the decline of collectively owned enterprises after the turn of the century is also evidence. So first rising uh, from the beginning of reform up until the turn of the century, then diminishing up to the almost non-existing by now. Nevertheless, so still it is fair to say that the Chinese, the remaining Chinese, the state-owned enterprises have been are still in control of the strategic in sectors of the economy, infrastructure, and high-tech sectors, and they are mostly the big firms in, the, in China, and also the state itself is by and large in control of the utilization of the total of China's economic surplus. That is, as we see, that uh, China's economic surplus has not been mainly capitalized. Instead, it has been mainly allocated under state control. But if this is the true at the macro level, then in the, at the micro level, it is still clear that labor, right, that the employment system, first of all, that the share of public sector employment has been declining down to a very low level in industry, down to 13% by 2012, and now even lower. And or even within the core sectors of state-owned and state industries or state-owned enterprises, that the employment relations have been virtually entirely marketized. So on the whole, we can safely judge that insofar as there are still socialist aspirations in Chinese political economy, they are not embodied in the micro units or in terms of the pervasive public ownership and not in terms of workers as masters of the societies. But because of time limits, so I won't be able to go into more details about this second bit about the, the regimes of accumulations. What I want to quickly indicate is that we can identify four different stages in the history of the PRC in terms of the models of the regime of accumulation. That starting with the Soviet type regime based on state planning and pervasive public ownership, which turns out to be problematic in the context of a very, very low income economy, the economic surplus available for accumulation was just too little. Therefore, China could not have the luxury to pursue the Soviet the model of, of emphasizing uh, the specialized division of labor, economies of scales, et cetera. Instead, we need to move on to the second regime of accumulation that is the going back to its revolutionary traditions of uh, em the emphasis on mobilization of resources at the expense of technical and allocated efficiency. But what is important is to be able to mobilize resources based on spiritual rather than material incentives that work up until the middle of the 1970s. But increasingly, as we see that um, the fatigue of, the, that is the diminishing the, the revolutionary spirits, as well as the increasing alienation of the bureaucrats to become increasingly dissociated with the, the people, making it difficult to sustain the revolutionary regime of accumulation. And that as a result, willingly or unwillingly, actually starting from Mao rather than from Deng Xiaoping, that China began to uh, attempt decentralization to start to open up and gradually start to implement market reforms. Now, it's a system of market socialism in the sense that the market coordination of economic activities, but the, the market agents were mostly or almost entirely state-owned enterprises 
or uh, or uh, uh, collectively owned enterprises. The outcome is quite conceivable about the intrinsic tendency of market socialism is the lack of accumulation, right? as we have seen, the diminishing, the, the, the downward sloping of the uh, incremental capital up ratio. And then from the turn of the century, with the deepening of China's integration into the world market. So the market environment confronting China is no longer the market under the control of the state, or at least uh, coordinated by the state. It is rather the globalized right, and financialized competitions. And therefore we have seen since the turn of the century is the process of rivalry between the liberalization and neoliberalization. And in the event, we can see that because of the ultimate control of the state over the utilization of economic surplus, at least at the macro level, therefore the neoliberalization has tend to prevail despite the twists and turns, right? so in particular the ups and downs of speculative bubbles. And therefore we can see the continual, the, the upward movement of the incremental up, output ratio that is the continuous pursuit of capital deepening industrialization. By the way, I, I strongly, uh, I'm strongly skeptical of the claim that Chinese development has been based on cheap labor. If anything, the productivity growth in China, labor productivity growth has been exceedingly fast, almost 9% a year from the beginning, beginning of reform up until now. And in relation to that, wage growth, the growth of the wage rate has been very, very fast. So that, that is uh, antithetical to the claim of cheap labor and exploitation or super exploitation. But now that because of time limits, let me that try to, uh, based on what I have talked about, let me try to move on to talk about socialism. Now, as mentioned, I, I would, like to make use of the concept of historical socialism rather than socialism from the from definition from principles because after all socialism uh, the, or the aspiration or the orientation are scientific not utopian so any appropriate approach to, to assess historical experiences need to clarify whether or not and in what ways socialist aspirations are achieved in relation to the given constraint of historical conditions. Historical conditions, that is capitalism in or historical capitalism, right? that all the society in the world, including those revolutionary societies that pursues this, this linking such as China under the, uh, the Cultural Revolution, are under the pressure of the systemic logic of capitalism. Now, the, in the light of the nature of the PLCs, and in this light, the, the, the PLC and countries of the former Soviet bloc is not strictly speaking socialist in, uh, in relation to the definition and the principles. But nevertheless, that they can be conceptualized as revolutionary societies vis-a-vis -vis world capitalism, confronting the historical conditions which make it impossible for these societies to replicate the experience of modernization in the advanced capitalism. And therefore, they need to undergo a process of primitive accumulation. And this is the tension between the socialist pursuits and the pursuits of modernization. Now, the primitive accumulation could, over the long term, results in the so-called systemic, systematic fatigue on the part of the people and systematic alienation on the part of the bureaucrats. And therefore, long-term continuous improvement in the living standards of the people is necessary. Sustaining the revolutionary spirit of the people is also necessary. And therefore, the, the status 
of the working people as master of society is as important as the accumulation itself. And it is fair to say that in so far as China has retained elements of the socialist inspirations, this remains an unresolved issue. So I, I hope this the presentation makes sense to you. Thanks. Very much so. Thank you very much, Techno. Thanks for the presentation. Okay, I will pass it over to um, Liu Zixun, Professor Liu. Over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Liu. Just let me just do a little bit introduction. Um, the paper is done by Professor Chang Anfu, but um, Professor Liu is going to present it on Dr. Cheng's behalf. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, hi, good uh, evening or good afternoon if you are in London time. I have to apologize, midnight in Beijing actually. So if I stop making sense occasionally, uh, I apologize in advance. Uh, and partly that's, that's the reason why Professor Chen cannot personally present his paper here. Um, so it's, I find this uh, panel very interesting because all the presentations are so tightly bound by the same question that they try to address. And uh, I'm sure that with the perspective that everyone presents, we can uh, have a very interesting and inspiring discussion afterwards. Um, it's, of course, it's a pleasure, great pleasure to participate in this uh, interesting conference. And I would like to use this opportunity to share with you my idea on uh, the issue of socialism. Actually, I want to have a slight change of the title of my presentation to uh, the three stages of socialism and China socialism as a market socialism with elements of state capitalism. The core of my argument is that China today has a socialist system with substantial elements of state capitalism. Uh, my argument follows a very different line from China's official classification of the primary stage of socialism based on uh, degree of productivity, average GDP, and standard of living, which in turn actually differs in important respects from current economic development in China. My analysis will follow the spirit of Marx's methodology take changes in productivity as an indirect or ultimate sign and take changes in the relations of production as the key determinant of each stage. These relations are revealed in the systems of property rights, distribution, and regulation. Uh, their qualitative changes will, uh, will correspond to the primary, intermediate, and advanced stages of socialism. I will also analyze the characteristics of production, exchange, and distribution in each stage as well, as well as micro, medium, and macro level economic management in each stage. The goal is to develop a framework to address the various forms of conflicts and constraints at each, each stage with due consideration given to politics and the state at the level of the superstructure. So the first section I want to deal, in the first section I want to deal with economic characteristics and core elements of the primary stage of socialism. The basic characteristics of the primary stage of socialism are well known. First, the property rights system is a multi-ownership in which public ownership is dominant and it promotes the second, the sound development of non-public economy. This is the foundation of socialism with Chinese characteristic in China today, and the chief economic criterion for considering China socialist in nature and in direction. The second feature of the primary stage of socialism, stage of socialism is that despite a multiplicity of forms of ownership, 
the distribution of income prioritizes labor as the major factor because public ownership dominates. This permits eliminating, eliminating income inequality and achieving common prosperity so that the fruits of the reform and development will benefit all the people. Thirdly, economic coordination is achieved in China through a state-led multi-structure market system, which gives full play to the fundamental or what is called by official discourse, the decisive role of the market in general resource allocation, while macro and micro adjustment by the government. Uh, fourthly and finally, on the economic basis, the superstructure at the primary stage of socialism is expressed as an inadequate or not fully developed democratic system, but nonetheless with the implementation of people's democratic dictatorship led by the working class and based on a worker peasant alliance, that is the dictatorship of the proletariat as in Marx and Lenin. Uh, the second section I talks about, I want to talk about economic characteristics and core elements of the intermediate and advanced stages of socialism. The intermediate and advanced stages of socialist mode of production cannot be fully specified at present, though we may say that they must, there must be, uh, they must lessen non-socialist content compared to the primary stage. In the intermediate stage, for instance, in the system of property rights, public ownership of the means of production must advance further and be implemented in many different forms. There will be no private ownership except in cases of foreign investment. In the distribution system, distribution according to work is more adequate, adequately practiced in various forms. Economic coordination and regulation must feature planned production in a more complete sense. That is to say, planned economy or pro product economy is overwhelm overwhelmingly dominant with market playing a very weak role. On such economic basis, the superstructure at the intermediate stage of socialism is expressed as, an more adequate, as a more adequately democratic system in which dictatorship exists only in the sense of defending the country against foreign invasion and state is still needed domestically to maintain such rights as distribution according to work. Lenin's vision of future socialist society in the state at the revolution should be realized at this intermediate stage. So far, uh, it is clear that Marx and Engels and Lenin in some sense envisioned the advanced state of socialism. Stalin and Mao, uh, Mao thought depict the intermediate stage of socialism. While socialism with Chinese characteristics formed during China's reform and opening up, in fact, represents the primary stage of socialism. Uh, the next stage, uh, now let's look at the next stage. The qualitative changes we may expect at the advanced stage of socialism as foreseen by the founders of Marxism can also be outlined. First, in the system of property rights, public ownership of the means of production is mature and is universally implemented in the whole society. Second, in the distribution system, distribution according to work is adequate and is universally implemented. Third, in the regulation system, planned economy is complete with the production of use values being generally throughout the, the economy. On this basis, on this economic basis, the superstructure of the advanced stage of socialism is characterized by an adequate democratic system and dictatorship exists only in the sense of defending against foreign invasion. State is in the process of withering away, but will still have to exist in order to safeguard such rights as, di as distribution according to work. Now in the next section, I will talk about the differences between economic systems in socialism, modern capitalism, and communism. Uh, I will demonstrate this with a table. So allow me to uh, share a different screen.
Thank you. Yes, so, we can see this. Okay. So at, from this table, you can see that the common feature of the primary, intermediate, and advanced stages of socialism is the public ownership of the means of production. And the differences lie in the degree of maturity and perfection of public ownership. In the advanced stage of socialism, the form of public ownership will become mature and perfect. And its main difference from the communist economic system lies in whether distribution according to need is realized. Characterized by the highest degree of economic fairness and efficiency, communism is the general direction of the development of human society, but its realization of force requires a series of conditions and a considerable period of time. To that end, five basic conditions must be met. Uh, number one, material condition, um, which means highly developed productive forces. Number two, economic condition, uh, a single communist public ownership of the means production, planned economy and distribution according to need. Number three, social condition, a highly developed education, science and technology and total elimination of the, of the division of mental and manual labor. Number four, uh, spiritual condition, greatly improved political consciousness and moral character. And number five, political condition, the elimination of class and the withering away of state. Uh, that being said, I, I want to say that uh, what I'm attempting to do is a theoretical innovation, which draws upon other academic research upon Marxist, Leninist classics and upon Chinese and foreign re uh, realities. It provides logically consistent answers uh, to some important theoretical and practical questions at different stages of development of socialism and is, it, and is of foundational principle and fundamental value in both academic and practical terms. Uh, it, it could be uh, become a very influential and representative uh, recognized theory of core elements of socialism in Chinese academia. Uh, there are some obvious differences between this new uh, idea that I present and currently prevalent ideas, such as socialism has no fixed definition, convergence of socialism and capitalism, permanent stage, uh, primary stage of socialism or communism equals public ownership and planned economy is not working, market economy is permanent, et cetera, et cetera. My argument differs markedly from all these ideas. The basic conclusions of my analysis of contemporary China as, are as follows. It has a political system of socialism that exercises the unified leadership and governance based on a new type of democratic centralism. It has an ideological, ideological and cultural system of socialism that adheres to Marxism, Leninism and its sinicization. It has a market system of socialism with state control and regulation as the mainstay that contains significant number of elements of state capitalism as defined by Lenin, that is socialist con country developed some, developing some extent of capitalist private ownership. Uh, of course, my, I myself believe that in the, in the best economic system of primary stage of socialism, a uh, non-public economy should account for only one third of the entire economy. At present, of course, non-public economy is far greater than one third. Uh, it means that this is a topic under uh, heated debate and unified consciousness is, the, is not yet formed. Uh, and in the last, to the last point, I want to add my own observation uh, that since um, I observe that both Michael and uh, uh, Dick data stop about the uh, proportion of private and uh, private sector in Chinese economy uh, ended in the year of 2011 or 2012. Uh, actually, after that year, uh, in the past decade, beginning from 2011, uh, 
there's a reverse in trend. There's a strengthening of public ownership in Chinese economy, and there have been greater constraints on private capital uh, in China. So it is it is a gradual change, slow but gradual changes can be observed. And in that sense, uh, it seems that the struggle is continuing and there's a dialectical uh, development which we are still uh, looking, uh, expecting some uh, very important changes happening to the structure of Chinese economy. Uh, thank you very much, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Liu, for presenting on behalf of um, Chang Anfu, and it was very insightful. Thank you for your contribution and also for staying up late for the event. We understand if a you pleasure. need to leave early, but um, I'm sure there are quite a lot of questions. If you can stay, but we will be very grateful. Um, so... I, I will. I will stay. I will. Stay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Kind of awkward because I can. Uh use the help of coffee or tea at this time yes, of the yes, day, please, please, please. Uh, but I will stay. Thank you. So now we are open to any questions. If you want to ask questions, please raise your hand, use the raise hand button. So I will ask the first one before Elias. <laughs> yes. Um, Walter, um, thank you for the presentation. I just wanted to ask you because um, it seems that you say it's super exploitation of the Chinese labor is almost the backbone of the Chinese economy. Well, that is quite a big claim because super exploitation means that labor do not even have the ability to reproduce their labor. Do you mean like workers in China are in that kind of situation that they cannot even reproduce their labor? Um, because it doesn't seem to be corresponding to what we are seeing on the ground. There are lots of improvements to the working conditions and also um, um, for example, Dick has written some papers about the workers, um, the, 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 the growth of the wages actually superseded the productivity rise. So that means there is the improvement in the workers living or, or, or the wages that they receive anyway. So um, just wanted to ask you to clarify on that point. And also you said there were forced labor in Xinjiang. Just wanted to ask you the source of that claim because it is a controversial subject and um, there has been quite a lot of um, rumors of that, but there are claims from someone called Adrian Sands and that has been debunked by quite a lot of people about um, the data source of that kind of claim. So just wanted to ask you to clarify that as well. Well, Professor Liu, just wanted to ask you if you can say anything more about the workers' um, participation or the share of the workers in any of the decision-making of the policies, because quite a lot of people think that it is only the bureaucracy that is making decisions and the workers have been deprived of their rights or, or their participation in all this. So just wonder if you wanted to um, give us some details of how this mechanism actually works, how they participate. So these are two, my two questions for the two speakers. Okay, Elias, please unmute yourself. Thank you too much. It's very, very special uh, panel uh, on the on the presentations of Michael Roberts, Dick Lo, and uh, Cheng In Fu, I think that we should to should to to change the terms of discussion socialism nowadays, because the uh, I think uh, socialism is very very new mode of production, only uh, one hundred years, and we are in uh, we are the socialism in a learning process yet. Uh, and the concept manifests in itself in the real movement. In, the, uh, in other words, uh, we need to find the historical form of uh, that socialism manifests in itself, uh, manifests, manifests in the world today. Uh, we need to find the historical form because it's very uh, the the distance for, for example, workers' democracy in, 
or abolish the private property is a long-term uh, targets. Uh, so we, we should to, to find the historical form of socialism today. I think that the socialism today and nowadays uh, appears in the world uh, a frog, uh, the transformation of the reason in a tool of government. This is the his, historical form of socialism today. Uh, the transformation of the reason in government uh, uh, tool uh, is a very, very different in uh, capitalist counts. This is another discussion about the, the, the speech of the Professor Walter. Uh, Professor Walter, what's the evidence? I repeat the question about the slave labor, uh, labor in Xinjiang. I was in Xinjiang twice. I I I I know the main cities in Xinjiang, and I I was I I didn't uh, observe any evidence of uh, slave labor uh, or super exploitation of labor there. On contrary. Uh, GDP per capita in Xinjiang grew 110% in, in the last 10 years. This is the data, it's not my point of view. In China, in China, uh, according to the, the International Labor uh, Organization, the salaries growth 280% in the last 10 years above the productivity and inflation during this period. The period. Uh, in my account, it's a democratic account, it always uh, is on contrary. Uh, I don't see evidences to in now China now uh, workers uh, use the, 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 the very, very cheap uh, labor uh, as an engine to economy, it's not uh, not make sense. China reached the, the fourth re industrial revolution. Uh, uh, not make sense in my point of view, and the data show the contrary. Yeah? About imperialism, I am Brazilian. I live in Brazil. I, I, I for example, in Brazil, the average of profit rate of Western companies in Brazil by year is 12.5% uh, by year. The Chinese companies here, here in Brazil, Michael Roberts, you love this discussion. <laughs> in Brazil, the, the, the profit rate is the one point percent by year in general. In a several cases, 1.0.5, is companies a uh, factor? It's not not financial system. The, the, the Western banks in Brazil, for example, uh, they they use the the our interest rates to to buy the the public the public assets to uh, etc. The IMF imposed to Brazil a lot of things, a lot of tools. Uh, to uh, change for loans, for example, our economy, Professor Walter, was destroyed after the IMF imposed to Brazil the open, openness the capital account of my in my country. My account, my, my our economy was destroyed. The Chinese uh, businesses in Brazil they imposed nothing to Brazil. The same way the Chinese uh, didn't impose nothing to African country. Nothing. On contrary, the recent deal between Iran and, and China, 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 China uh, uh, will provide all uh, infrastructure to Iran, for example, the, the subway of Tehran will move to Iran 1,000 uh, production uh, factors to Iran and transfer the technology for, uh, for uh, railways uh, to Iran. 
In my, in my point of view, is very, very interesting uh, due to Iran. Very different the Western countries in Brazil, in Latin America, in Africa. Uh, I think that the, 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 this, this, this point about in Chinese imperialism, for example, Lenin link, link, the, the, the link the imperialism with the, with the tendency of violence. China never invaded any country in the world. United States destroyed Libya. United States destroyed Syria. United States destroyed a lot of uh, Afghanistan. And China, I don't know if China invaded the, 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 uh, any country or, or destroyed any country. We, we need to use the, the, the very ample, a huge concept of imperialism. Uh, my last point uh, is the low ones. Uh, in, 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 in some, it's very different, very, very different, the way of treatment between Chinese and periphery and my country, Brazil, and Western counters and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, in the in Brazil. I'm living in the periphery of capitalism. Yeah. Ch China support Venezuela. China support Cuba. China support Palestinian fight. It's very different if American actions. Thank you too much. I'm sorry. Thank you, Elias. I got two more hands. Um, John Smith, please. Yes, please unmute yourself. Uh, yes, Thank I've you. turned my microphone off. Thank you. Um, I'll just put my hand down. Well, there's so much, so many interesting issues have been raised here. Um, I just wanted to raise two things that I think need to be put into the picture. I, I, um, it's a hugely complex question: how China is developing, where it's developing to, how to characterize the Chinese uh, uh, social system at the moment. I'm not going to attempt to do that. All I would say is that. I think we have to see all of this within a global context. That is the first and most important thing. The construction of socialism cannot be viewed within a national context. That is a very important thing. And I would just like to point out that at no point in its history has the Chinese leadership ever carried out a proletarian internationalist foreign policy. I would, that is something I just want to assert. I would give examples like the first country in the world to recognize the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile was the Chinese government. And they did this on the grounds that the biggest enemy was Soviet social imperialism. The country which fought alongside apartheid South Africa against the Cubans and against the liberation forces in Angola was China. These are facts that need to be just put on, onto the plate. And they fit into a, a continuing pattern today where we see the Chinese government forming strong alliances with some of the most brutal reactionary governments in the world. And I'm talking about the Duterte in the Philippines. I'm talking about the, 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 the people who committed genocide against the Tamil people in, uh, in Sri Lanka and many other cases. So on the other hand, yes, I do recognize the Chinese government is supporting Cuba, is supporting Iran, is supporting Venezuela. This is just one of many big contradictions. China is a gigantic contradiction. Anyway, I just want to point out one thing, and that is, first of all, uh, just to raise the point about super exploitation, there is an alternative definition of super exploitation rather than the simple crude one that uh, uh, value of labor power is below the basic means of subsistence. And that is a rate of exploitation which is higher than the global average. The reason why the United States and Western corporations shifted so much production to China was because higher rates of exploitation were available in that country. Deng Xiaoping's opening of China actually threw a lifeline to global capitalism, which was facing a systemic crisis. One of the ways, a crucial way that this global capitalism escaped from the crisis of the 1970s was by substituting much lower paid more highly exploited workers in countries like China, particularly China, for much higher paid workers at home. The different rate of exploitation, much higher rate of exploitation available to imperialist corporations 
was one of the key factors enabling capitalism to have a new lease of life during the 1980s and the 1990s. These are, are this is a, a basic, I think, uh, incontrovertible fact in my opinion, uh, and it gives rise to a very different definition and concept of super exploitation. In other words, a rate of exploitation that is much higher than that that is available within the imperialist countries. Um, but this wasn't the only, I think China, with its globe, with its opening, uh, with Deng Xiaoping's reforms, um, threw a lifeline to global capitalism uh, in the 1980s, 1990s. This wasn't the first and only time uh, that they have thrown a lifeline to global capitalism. And I'm not blaming them necessarily for this, but in 2009, they, the massive stimulus boost to the Chinese economy of 34% of GDP helped not only China to avoid dip, uh, diving into a deep recession, but also help to maintain um, uh, economic growth at much lower levels, nevertheless, across the emerging countries, in countries like Brazil as well, by providing demand for, for, for the primary commodities that Brazil and Africa and other countries um, exported. Um, and when, uh, when Michael, in his uh, presentation, looked at the uh, difference between the impact of recessions in China and in the imperialist countries. Really, you can't really make that, uh, that, that is not an appropriate analogy. I think um, the fact is, is that the global financial crisis did not plunge anywhere in the world into recession apart from the imperialist countries. The, the, after, the, uh, the global financial crisis is only now catching up with the, with the uh, oppressed nations of the world. And it's also including in China with, with progressively lower and lower and lower growth rates. But anyway, uh, in 2015, 2016, the Chinese economy again threw a lifeline to the global capitalist economy. An even bigger massive credit stimulus of 41% of GDP helped China avoid dipping into recession and help to maintain the anemic sort of post uh, global financial crisis semi recovery, which is not really any kind of recovery at all. Global capitalism is still on its deathbed with, with negative interest rates and so on. But this raises the question about the role of credit, um, with the massive debt piles that now is about to burst on all of our heads with $300 billion owed by one single Chinese company now faced with default that is ever grand and this is going to have global consequences and the last point I wanted to make uh, very quickly and that is that China amazingly now according to I'll put in uh, um, into chat uh, uh, a document which studies China's overseas lending China um, is has lent 370 billion dollars to developing and emerging countries. The total amount of debt owed, uh, uh, official debt owed to um, Chinese state-owned banks, 370 billion compared to Paris club debts of, uh, of 246 billion. It is incredible the extent to which China has emerged as a major lender. What is also significant is that according to this study, and maybe somebody can find a way of refuting it, but it seems to be very, uh, well researched is that China's loans to poor countries are at commercial interest rates. So we have this amazing paradox at the moment. China has lent huge amounts of money to the US, to US imperialism by buying US treasury bonds at negative interest rates. China is losing money on the money that it's lent to the United States. However, it is compensating itself for these losses by charging market rates to countries in Africa and elsewhere for its commercial loans to these countries. I think there is, uh, I would say just in summary of my own point is that I think China is in a transitional uh, stage of the economy. I think that transition towards socialism requires communist leadership. I don't think China has a communist leadership. And finally, I think that China does exhibit very clear imperialistic tendencies. Just look at Myanmar today. Who is backing the Myanmar regime? Who is providing it with the weapons? And where are the Chinese companies which are profiting from super exploited Myanmar labor? Um, anyway, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes, sorry. Um, yeah, I need to give it to um, Jonathan. He did raise his hand um, by talking to me because um, his button wasn't there. So Jonathan, please go ahead. Thank you. 
Uh, just a brief question addressed to Liu and to Michael. Um, because um, although there were important nuances uh, in uh, what uh, difference nuances between what you said, both of you seem to outline the kind of process where we move from um, cap uh, capitalism with a dominant public sec uh, private sector, dominant uh, law of value, and the subordinate public sector, that we move from then to a dominant public sector and a subordinate private and law of value sector. And then as things progress, that private sector subject to the law of value decreases until we reach the final stage of communism, in which basically everything will be one big factory uh, planned from the center, and that will be the economy. I might be uh, making a bit of schematic, uh, the points you're making, but that is a fairly traditional view held by the left over a long period of time, is that is the direction which we're heading in. I just want to ask you, why? Why should we move in that direction? I mean, sure, yeah, the public sector should be dom become dominant sector. That's the basis for socialism. But why should we move in the direction of one big industry automated, centrally planned? I see no reason for it. I haven't had that ever explained to me. It presupposes that all parts of the economy undergo the same process of socialization and that there are future productivity gains there to be taken by completing that process. I can see large sectors of the economy which aren't suited to that at all. I take restaurants, for example. What is the point of having one big centrally planned restaurant feeding people throughout the world? It makes no sense whatsoever from an economic point of view to me. So I see rather a process of public sector, dominant sector developing, continuing to strengthen, and a private sector becoming transformed in what one might call a personalized sector, personalized production, um, which is uh, leaves up to individual initiatives, people to privately produce things, and then they will become part of a gift economy. That I see more as a kind of the duality which we already have in China, the opposite duality as a natural, more natural way of progressing into the future. Uh, also, uh, I find it a bit confusing in Leo's uh, 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 presentation, he puts cooperatives as part of the public sector. I, I don't see why they're part of the public sector. Cooperatives are private companies where one has decided that all the shareholders have equal votes and the shareholders only the people who work in the same company. It's, it's a completely, it's a capitalist company except for the it's the distribution of the power within the company itself. It's subject to the same market forces. It's not part of the public sector. And so I, if you could explain that. So those are the questions I have. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. And I saw that people have raised 10 as well, but I think we have enough for the first round. So I will give it back to the speakers. Professor Liu, if you want to speak first and then to Walter and then Dick and um, Michael. Please unmute yourself, Professor Du Liu. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the quest comments and questions. I will try to re respond in a coherent way at this time of the night. Um, first to uh, Professor Kyung, uh, Sam Keith's uh, question about workers' democracy in China. I think it is, uh, for me, uh, democracy means economic de uh, democracy in the first place. Uh, and what China has been doing is to uh, 
what we have a term called common prosperity. And it's the goal of all the development and of, at least at the state of primary, uh, primary state of socialism. And with economic democracy, with economic equality and uh, what we call common prosperity, people can have an equal saying, equal voice in their working environment, for example. And that is the, at least the goal of our uh, effort. And I have to admit that in China, uh, for work, work because of the composition of workers today are mostly immigrant workers, which are quite different from uh, the old factories uh, 40, 50 years ago. And therefore uh, the grassroots, the grassroots democracy actually works better in rural, uh, rural China than in, uh, among the workers. Uh, who are not as organized as they were uh, before. And, and uh, I admit that in that aspect, people, uh, workers uh, need to be more organized uh, and the union should play a better role uh, than it is today. And then to uh, Jonathan's question, uh, I don't remember I ever talked about cooperative as part of the public sector. Uh, I don't know where where, where the, the, the question comes from. Uh, it's well, but, you wrote it in, in the presentation, your written presentation, it says that. Do you mean, Jonathan, do you mean the table? Was it in the table? It, it was in the table. Okay, right. Okay. Um, I need to go back to, to the table and, and take a look, but uh, uh, first to address the question, why do we move to that direction? Um, I, why not? I mean, I, 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 I agree with you that restaurants, yes, it couldn't, shouldn't be a big dominant uh, company providing food for everyone. And, but I can do it, think about other sectors, especially we're talking about economic structure and we're talking about ownership of the means product of production. And it is in that sense that we are talking about the dominant, the, the dominant role of the public sector. Uh, I think under the current situation of the COVID-19 ep epidemic, uh, the role of the public sector is quite clear. Uh, without the public sector playing a dominant role, China couldn't possibly uh, eliminate all the cases, you know, as long as early as, you know, mid uh, June last year, uh, China has eliminated all its domestic cases of COVID-19, which I think is quite obvious why we should have a public sector. And uh, without the planning, without the macro regulation and management it is not close to any possibility uh, of achieving that goal. And now I'm going back to the table. I'll, I'll give the ground to others. I'll go back to the table and see where the cooperative is from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Um, Walter? Okay. Um, oh, lot, lots of questions here. Um, First of all, um, on, on the on the super exploitation of migrant laborers, um, I, I basically just have to uh, repeat what John Smith had said. The question of super exploitation has to be looked at internationally. Imperialist companies went to China and other third world countries because they could get, they could they could pay wages much less than what they pay in the in the imperialist countries. In that sense, is internationally. It's an international level of, of super exploitation, and many of the workers in the firms that work for for the imperialist countries are the hundreds of millions of, of migrant laborers. The other aspect of that is their wage is inadequate for social reproduction. They are not in the cities in the cities where they work. They do not have the right to health benefits, to education for their children and so forth these have they have to go back to their to the rural uh villages for that 
and they also have to rely on income from the rural villages to supplement inadequate wages. But that's always, that's true in many third world countries that um, workers in, in factories can be super exploited, but yet survive. Um, one reply to um, uh, Elias, you pointed, out, you pointed out that the Brazilian rate of profit earned by Chinese corporations is significantly less than that of imperialist corporations. Um, I certainly don't challenge that. In fact, I said one of the reasons that I don't think China qualifies as an imperialist country is because of that. Its investments abroad do not meet uh, imperialist standards. It does it for different reasons. And uh, uh, that, that is in order to enable the extraction of surplus value from its own working classes, not so much from, from those abroad. But perhaps the most interesting or important question to deal with is the question of the Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang. Um, comrades here report that they have been to uh, Xinjiang and they don't see the same reports as the Western press. But of course, there are plenty of Western reporters um, and not ones who are, who are sympathetic to Western imperialism who have gone to Xinjiang and interviewed people, interviewed, also interviewed Uyghurs who have left China and who have described the intolerable conditions that they are, uh, that they are, that they have been subjected to. Something like 10% of the population has been put to um, these labor camps for uh, re-education, but nevertheless, whenever a government makes that, that, that claim, um, or, uh, or uh, about about its own population, it's something very to be very suspicious about. And I uh, something I want to point out uh, as someone myself who lives in New York, China has accused, as as has said that what it has to do in Xinjiang is because it has to stop terrorism. Living in New York, I have some experience of this. Uh, Twenty years ago, New York was indeed a victim of terrorists in the uh, September 11th uh, attacks. But immediately afterward, there were politicians and other public figures accusing not just the, the handful of people who committed this crime and their backers of being terrorists, but accusing all Muslims of being terrorists. And that's not a unique phenomenon. It goes back through history. When the, when the, as, the, as the United States expanded westward, all Indians were labeled savages. In South Africa, under apartheid, all the liberation activists were labeled terrorists. All the Palestinians today are labeled terrorists by the Israeli government. Irish liberation fighters were labeled terrorists. So Chinese authorities who claim that the Uyghur nationalist activ activists are terrorists are taking advantage of the U.S. war on terrorism. In fact, the charge of terrorism against the Uyghurs started in support of the U.S. crackdown, the U.S. war on terrorism 20, 20 years ago. It's very suspicious. When, when a government accuses its victims of being terrorists or being led by terrorists. And anyone who take, takes the word of oppressors that an oppressed people are terrorists ought to understand that they are lining up with imperialist style propaganda. And that's certainly what, what, what China is, is doing in its propaganda about, about terrorism. Now, the, the reports are, are, are not only co coming from, from, from right wing writers, they, they, are, they are all over they are produced by interviewing with many Uyghurs, and I, I don't think it's a deniable fact that the Uyghurs are, are oppressed and in many cases subjected to forced labor. I did not say slave labor, by the way, but that's a, that's a secondary dis distinction. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I, I have not received any questions uh, on my presentation. So what I want to do is to elaborate a little bit in relation to the discussion that on the various issues. Now, the, uh, Patrick Baum mentioned that uh, China has been in support of the imperialist institutions, such as the UN. Right? And uh, John Smith also mentioned that China buying US uh, treasury bonds as a sign of the supporting the existing uh, imperialist system, right? and it's not just that uh, China's uh, uh, stimulus uh, packages uh, popping up the world economy in crisis and so on. Now, of course, the question is that what is the alternative? Right? 
without the alternative, how a feasible alternative, what could what could be done? Say China, if China is not in the UN, and that was the situation before 1971, its survival was in question. Now, if China uh, does not buy US treasury bonds, then that would be serious problems for the Chinese economy because China's position in the capitalist or in the world economy is very much dependent on the the hegemony of the dollar. So the, all this indicates that it's China has been forced to do so rather than willingly to do so. But then that is the uh, perhaps the most fundamental question about super exploitation defines in uh, John Smith's uh, sense, which I think is reasonable. But then that is the question as to what is the possible alternative. Now, perhaps I can share you a, just very quickly a, a figure, which uh, I think is uh, telling, but uh, indicating labor productivity of Chinese urban, uh, so labor productivity is the curve in red, China's urban wage rate in real terms, China's migrant workers wage rate, also in real terms, both substantially exceeding that of the labor productivity from the year 2000 to uh, now. But, and uh, labor productivity growing exceedingly fast, almost 9% a year. Now, this is unique in the world. If you look at the reports by the ILO, you know that across the world, wage stagnation has been the case. Now, therefore, it might well be true that it is still super exploitation in John Smith's definition, but because productivity growth is not absolute the surplus value production, is relative surplus value production, but nevertheless, it could still be uh, classified as super exploitation according to that definitions. But then that there is the question, if not super exploitation, what could have been done? Now, I'm not saying that there's no better alternative, but it is equally difficult as well. So what China has done is that at the subwise suffering from super exploitation, it has managed to have the developments, which we have indicated earlier in my presentation, as opposed to a world that is very dismal or miserable. So unless we can have a feasible alternative, it is difficult to just to criticize and to, or just to dismiss. But it's just to dismiss it is not really a, a serious criticism. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Well, guys, China's political structure is clearly not democratic. Workers uh, do not have open and opportunities to dictate or control or uh, change the leadership of uh, the Communist Party through any process that we would probably consider democratic. The regime operates in an autocratic way. Uh, it has cynical policies when it comes to foreign policy, as John has mentioned a few. Uh, it no doubt operates a, a rather uh, autocratic and uh, repressive regime, maybe against certain elements in Uyghurs and elsewhere, uh, as it sees necessary. All those things may well be true, but it, it doesn't seem to me that that explains it uh, or delivers the argument that in some way that it is capitalist or imperialist. Uh, to take um, the argument of John that uh, he's going to change Marx's view of super exploitation, which is where uh, the compensation from workers is less than the value of their labor power, their ability to reproduce. Uh, he says, let's get rid of that. Let's go for an international uh, rate of super exploitation. And anybody below that is clearly being super exploited. And those above 
I'm not. Well, if you take that definition, it's not just China. I would say probably four billion uh, people are now super exploited on that definition uh, because it doesn't. It's such an average, which means nothing at all, really, in relation to uh, what is going on in each individual country. In my view, I live in the UK. People are super exploited here. There are one million people on uh, uh, zero hours calls. There are people who are not earning enough money, even on the bare minimum, uh, without having to resort to maybe several jobs and their conditions are very poor indeed. So there's super exploitation everywhere. And the argument that uh, super exploitation is a uh, justification for saying that China is capitalist. Well, it, it seems to me a very limited and weak argument, particularly when you turn it into an international average, rather than looking at the individual positions in various countries. Uh, that definition seems to me to open up uh, a, a, a position where you don't really have any explanation of what's going on. What we do know is that 850 million Chinese have been moved out of at least the World Bank minimum level, which they regard as poverty level over the period of the last 30 to 40 years. That's a massive increase in uh, removing people out of poverty. And during the period of COVID, where 150 million other people, maybe more, have been driven back into poverty in various parts of the world, uh, China has continued to be able to reduce its poverty rates. It's not down to a level which I consider the abolition of poverty, as claimed by the uh, government, because they're, if we're using the World Bank level, that's far too low. But even if you take a higher level, there is only one country which is seeing a dramatic reduction in the level of poverty uh, in its uh, population, and that is uh, China. So if there's super exploitation going on in China, then it's uh, getting weaker. That's the only thing I can conclude uh, from the data that we see there. Now, the argument that because the Chinese government and the state-led sector of the economy managed to avoid a recession in 2008-9, like the rest of the imperialist countries, by state investment and fiscal stimulus, and banks providing funds for that to be carried out is in some ways saving capitalism, seems to me a ridiculous statement to make. China had to do that to it's, uh, preserve its economy and keep up the standards and prosperity uh, uh, insofar as it existed for the Chinese people. If there was an indirect result in that, it helped imperialism to, to recover uh, during the Great Recession. Well, how can China be uh, blamed uh, for that uh, task? It seems a very odd argument to make that China is capitalist or imperialist because its measures that it took place in its own country uh, during the, the Great Recession somehow helped to save the capitalism. Actually, it didn't. Uh, certainly, as John admits, the imperialist countries still went, had a big slump. Uh, the emerging economies had a significant reduction in growth. If you look at the growth rates of China during the period 2008 to 2010, it remained close to double digits. Nobody else could achieve that. The only other country of a major capitalist economy, as you call imperialist, which survived the recession in 2008-10 was Australia. Why was that? Because its main export destination was China. So China saved Australia. I don't think it saved uh, the rest of the world. Uh, and so that's not an argument for saying that it's therefore part of the capitalist system. I just cannot see how those arguments hold together. On the question of restaurants, well, you know, uh, as far as I'm concerned, we started off with a discussion of saying that communism and socialism means the end of money, it means the end of the state machine, it means the withering of the state, it means uh, production directly to people on the basis of their need. That's, that's the aim of communism or socialism. That's what we want to achieve. We want to get away, away of the class politics, get away of uh, commodity exchange by profit, the exploitation and inequality that goes on. That's the society that we're aiming for. Now, in this society that we could move towards socialism, maybe individual people would like to have, they've got loads of time, to set up a, a restaurant, a, a pop-up, and deliver the best possible food to people because they'll be able to collect it from the collective stores, all the raw materials for nothing, if they need it, they can they do that and they can reproduce it. And I'm very happy to attend uh, that restaurant. I don't see what that's got to do with uh, suggesting that we can't have, we, we must reject planning on the grounds that we, we will exclude little restaurants being set up by people as they see fit. Uh, I do not understand this argument. The transition to communism requires the, the basis of developing the public ownership sector, increasing the planning uh, mechanism and reducing the law of value. 
But that doesn't mean to say that if we exclude the total law of value, we can't have restaurants set up by people in a corner. Uh, they have to be closed down because the central plan says you've got to have a huge restaurant. I don't know what that means. Uh, a national restaurant, I have no idea what that means. If we mean a chain of res small restaurants that people join uh, in order to provide us with services for nothing, because we'll be getting it direct under communism, not being paid a price for it. Uh, so I think there's a confusion here between the transition from capitalism to socialism and what socialism would mean. I don't think socialism means the end of individual restaurants. It means the individual, it, the end of restaurants that you pay for. That's it. Thank you, Michael. You makes us all hungry now. Thank you. <laughs> but um, yes, regarding the questions on, on Xinjiang, um, probably other issues regarding nationalities, just to remind everyone, we had a panel, a paper in the second panel that discussed that. Um, so if you want to revisit um, the discussion, you can go on to our YouTube and watch that. There was a paper on um, the issues of na nation and nationalisms and also on China, on Hong Kong as well. I think that would be of interest to quite a lot of people. So back to Professor Liu and then we have Xin Wen. Um, please unmute yourself, Liu. Okay, uh, two things. First, uh, my apologies for a mistake in the table. Uh, the, the, the content for uh, Oh, that includes co cooperative joint stock, etc., for the intermediate state of socialism. Uh, it shouldn't be there. Uh, the parentheses and the parentheses and the uh, various forms of public ownership. Uh, it shouldn't include the cooperative. I don't know why it it wasn't in the original text. I don't know why how it came into the table, but it shouldn't be there. And my apologies for for the confusion it caused. Um, and second. Uh, I, I, it seems I blow some confusion. Uh, when we talk about whether China is capitalist or socialism, uh, on what criteria? Uh, I think Michael deals with a little bit, uh, uh, deals with this issue a little bit in his talk, in his response. Uh, uh, Professor Chen's presentation actually uh, specifically talks about the criteria uh, or the standard on which based on which we talk about socialism or communism uh, and which according to him is uh, relations of production, uh, which I think we should have to remember, keep in mind when we talk about what we are uh, talking about China, uh, the nature of its uh, social structure. Uh, I remember, so there are various problems in China. Uh, there's exploitation of workers, there's uh, union problems, there are human rights problems uh, which exist everywhere in the world. Uh, we can't use those cases to make judgment about whether China is capitalist or socialist uh, simply because we can use the same cases to judge whether the United States is socialist. I remember in the 1980s, you know, when China was really poor, the living standard was very low. And when we talk about the welfare system in the Western countries, the living standard in the United States, the workers' conditions in the United States, there was a joke, but it has some truth in it. Uh, it reflects on people's belief. We talk about the United States, we say they are more socialist than China. But we cannot say, it would be ridiculous if we say that the United States is a socialist country because it, you know, it's welfare system, it's, living conditions of workers are better. Uh, it's the same to say that because China has a series of problems today, then it is capitalist. Uh, specific, specifically, I was surprised to see that the left, some people from the left seem to join the right, the far right, to accuse uh, the oppression of national minorities, uh, ethnic people, in, 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 for example, in the, the Uyghur in Xinjiang, uh, it is based on some manufactured facts or fake evidence that the, the, the right, the far right used to, uses to smear China on the international stage. And I was surprised to see that a lot of left people in the left join the far right to, to 
the, the same accusation, China. I, I was really confused. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much to you. Um, Xin Wen. Uh, hi, uh, I have a, qu a question to uh, Professor Michael Roberts. Uh, you mentioned that 68% uh, of private companies have party body. Um, uh, do, uh, do you mean that um, uh, it made China uh, less capitalist or more um, authoritarian? Because uh, I feel there are two, uh, there are, um, uh, there are two dimensions of meaning here, and uh, uh, I, I, uh, I feel that um, the party bodies in private company they uh, don't control the company. Uh, they are employees who uh, receive uh, uh, salary from the owner of that company, so they serve the interest of, of the private companies, and also the company will not uh, choose someone uh, they can't control. So, uh, so I think. <laughs> um, I think party bodies in private companies are just some uh, form of the socialist presence. They are not really controlling uh, the private company. Uh, and th thank you for your presentation. You, uh, it's, a present, uh, it's a learning process for me. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, I just wanted to mention that I noticed there are a lot of discussion in the chat room. I won't be able to read them all out. So if you wanted to make your points, please raise your hand and um, just um, just um, just talk to us. Okay, thank you. Um, Walter, raise your hand. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, some uh, responses to Michael, who raised the question of super exploitation and, and criticized uh, John Smith's uh, internationalist view of it. I think it might be worthwhile to uh, distinguish two kinds of super exploitation, relative and absolute. Um, the, the international form of super exploitation is relative to the wages that imperialist countries have to pay to workers in, in their home countries, and it, it pays third world workers much less. That would be relative super exploitation. An absolute su super exploitation would be paying workers less than the necessary to reproduce um, the, the working class to, to social reproduction. And I say, that doesn't mean the working class doesn't survive, but its wages don't, don't allow that. And I think both of those are taking place in China and, and especially in, in regard to the, um, the migrant workers. Um, various people have raised the, the, the fact that Chinese workers are, wages have been going up um along with productivity yes of course that's that's the class struggle and everyone who's a socialist or marxist should certainly be in supportive of this supportive of that um the fact remains that the workers aren't allowed to organize independently form the trade unions uh form uh workers clubs form uh parties independent of the uh ruling party so uh china's workers rights are are, are restricted nevertheless and China's workers, therefore, are, are restricted in how far they gain, how far they can wage the class struggle. Um, a further point to, to Michael, though, I, the, the, that I was wondering about: if you say China is in transition, presumably uh, the question is from from what to what? Is it now uh, capitalist trans transitioning to socialism or what? And if it's in transition, uh, what's the ruling class? when Marx and others put forth the idea of the, of the dictatorship of the proletariat as a transitional society between capitalism and socialism, and when Trotsky argued that the Soviet Union was a worker state and then a degenerated worker state somewhere be, in, in between uh, capitalism and socialism, th they were clear that the ruling class in those transitional societies was the working class, even if in a distorted way. But Michael, you argue that the Chinese working class is not the ruling class. So the Marxist question arises, who is? Um, and then one more on the uh, question of, of the Uyghurs. Um, I'm sorry, not, not relying on, on, on right-wing authorities. I've said there are, there are plenty of, of, of left-wing and, and liberal and academics who have reported on the situation in Uyghurs who are not in any way sympathetic to uh, anti-Chinese sentiments or American imperialism or anything like that. In fact, the far right in the United States 
is very much supportive of Chinese uh, uh, policies towards the Uyghurs. After all, the Uyghurs are Muslims and the far right in this country wants, in my country, the United States, wants is is always willing to attack Muslims. Donald Trump was 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 supportive of Xi Jinping's policy at one point. Then then his policy changed. Um, but the right wing in general is always supportive of any kind of suppression of Muslims um, anywhere. And as I think John Smith pointed out already in this discussion of the um, uh, the, the the Burmese in Myanmar. Whose, whose repressive regime is also supported uh, by China. So the, the right wingers support repressive governments everywhere. And they do not support struggles against them. Thank you, Walter. Um, I got one more hand from Otto. Now I know that we have gone beyond our finishing time. So it just really depends if you want to um, continue to go on. Maybe I suggest maybe 10 more minutes maximum because I know that people are tired, but um, thank you very much for the participation in the debate in the chat room as well. Please continue, feel free to continue at your point. So Otto, please unmute yourself, yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, of course, I will be very brief. Just two remarks. Um, Mao Zedong, economic growth, GDP growth. I mentioned 5%, Dick Lowe was at 3%, Michael Roberts, 6.7%. I checked the figures. So um, 1950 to 1976, that's whole Mao Zedong is roughly 5%. 1960 to 1980 might be 3%. And 1950 to 1978 might be roughly 6.7%. I think it's important that one day we agree on these figures because it's quite obvious that the evaluation uh, depends very much on, on these figures and we must uh, try to, to have some kind of common standard. My second point would be about Uyghur. Um, I see an extremely hated, uh, heated debate. Um, I would like to introduce just an element which seems very important to me, which is totally absent of the whole discussion everywhere in the media, academic community, etc. It's simply the fact that if you look in particular at Asia, so Central Asia, South Asia, Middle East, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, virtually everywhere where you have got national minorities over the last, let's say, three decades, you had massive armed insurgencies with tens of thousands or sometimes hundreds of thousands of death, which means extremely massive long-term destruction. We must be able to have what I'm always fighting for, um, but which is very difficult to get when we talk about China, a comparative perspective. Why is it that in so many Asian countries there is such widespread violence with uh, you know, conflict between central government and national minorities? We must address this issue. If we don't, then uh, everything we say about Xinjiang or about the Tibetans and so on is simply based on picking one example of a country and then very often <laughs> massively bashing, we need to get an understanding of the problem of national minorities. Also understand why in Europe we don't have it because there are no ma national minorities anymore in most countries. I know about how exactly they were virtually eradicated from a cultural and linguistic point of view. Um, so that, that's, that's really extremely important, but especially in Asia, really these problems are present. We must find solutions. There are interesting solutions in China, but this comparative approach is something I think we really need to de this, 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 this debate because it's really getting heated up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Otto. Um, yes, Dick, you have raised your hand. It's uh, just a quick uh, response to Otto's point about the numbers, that uh, GDP growth in China from 1952 to 78 is about 
6.7 percent or 6.6 percent. That's almost a consensus in the literature starting from the early work of uh, Kyle Riskin and confirmed by Chinese uh, reworking of statistics that were in, uh, with assistance of the uh, UN agencies. So there's no question about that. My number is about the per capita GDP growth in from 1960 until roughly 1980, because there was, uh, first of all, the fast growth in population. And secondly, the slowdown of growth entering the 1960s. Uh, that, um, that is why I say that uh, China was under the pressure to open up to start reforms, even early on from the time of Mao. And because the, it needs to have the access to technology, technological progress, it was entering the 1960s, in particular 1980s, uh, such as yeah, 1960s, it was in confrontation simultaneously with both of the two super superpowers, and therefore it was cut off from the rest of the world. And therefore entering the 1970s, it tried to uh, to get uh, have access to the world, uh, the, 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 the technology from the rest of the world. So the, the numbers are, con that they could be reconciled. There's, there's no problem with the numbers, but just that the, the broader context is that China indicates the, the case that even a, such a big country as China, delinking an autarky is not a viable the strategy for, not just for con, socialist construction, it's not viable for survival. Thank you, Dick. Um, I think there was a question for Michael. Now, before I go to Michael, just want to ask one more time, anyone wanted to raise your hand and speak? It's your final chance now. Okay, if no one, I will give it to Michael and then any of the speakers, if you want to run. Patrick, you finally just <laughs> raised your hand. You were too busy typing that. Patrick, <laughs> but you have to breathe, yes? Have to be brief, maybe one or two minutes, please. Um, sorry about that. Yes, where am I? I think I'm right here. Where am I? Here. Um, I'm in Johannesburg, and I'm very happy to meet all of the comrades. Listen, I do think all of you need to take on board the multilateral imperialist system and China's critical role in legitimating and financing, right? And then I've had such a nice talk with KS about what is the over-accumulation crisis. So I'd love all of you, dear comrades, to please, not now, but at some point in the future, really tackle China as a sub-imperial power facilitating and legitimating the West and causing a global economic crisis through overproduction. I hope I'm not uh, out of line. I think this is classical Marxism, whether geopolitics or uh, in the analysis of uh, the capital accumulation process. This is really the um, amplification of extreme uneven development. And I know we can tackle this together. I hope we have another chance. Thanks, comrades. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, Michael, you and then um, the rest of the speakers, if they want to speak, I will pass it over to Michael now. Well, I, I can't remember the original question. I do apologize uh, because it's some time since then and I've been having a row on the chat line. Um, but uh, if, the, if, the, if the questioner can remember, I'll try and quickly- It's from Sim one. Sim one. Yeah. what's your question again? Was it um, the share of the state sector? What did you... Oh yeah, yeah, I've got, I remember now, yeah. yeah. So I think the, uh, the, the evidence is that uh, what the Communist Party has done is in, in the sectors uh, where they're not state owned or publicly owned, uh, but are large and increasingly even smaller, they've started to, they introduced some time ago, the idea that Communist Party members will sit on the boards or they will monitor the activities of these companies and there will be some of the decision making role if, of these companies will include Communist Party representatives. That's clearly a move to control the private sector to some extent and bring it into line with the planning pla uh, targets that the uh, uh, Communist Party has got nationally, locally and regionally. So I see that as part of this tension would exist between uh, the, the capitalist sector, the large capitalist sector in China, with its billionaires, with its uh, uh, financial sector going out of control, as the, she has been saying recently, and the uh, aims and targets of the, of the planning mechanism and the, and the government's uh, policies uh, for China as such. So that's just one part of that, I think. Um, uh, uh, 
So I, the only other question I had was Patrick's last question. All I would say is, uh, I don't think uh, it's correct to say that uh, uh, the overaccumulation of capital and overproduction of capital has not been discussed by Marxists for some time. We won't go to that to now. I don't consider that China is uh, creating excess capacity in its economy, which is, is being pumped out to the rest of the world to get rid of it, as uh, you get to some extent in, in capitalist economies. That's not how I would pose it, but that's another subject. Thank you, Michael. Thank Yes, uh, my speed of typing is uh, too slow. So I I respond to Patrick's uh, point about, right, first of all, he talked about over capacity, uh, excess capacity, over accumulation. And I then mentioned that um, the, the China has been running deficits with the rest of the developing world. And then he shifted to the uh, new, the, another topic that um, export led growth is undesirable of developing countries. So even if China is running deficits with the developing countries, the developing countries are still uh, uh, being uh, uh, suffer suffered from export lack growth. And then I move on to say that export lack growth is not necessarily a, a bad thing, but it's export lack growth in the context of the unequal relationship between the North and the South that is problematic. And then he, he moves on again, shift to a new issue that um, yes, uh, ch uh, China importing uh, resources, primary commodities from the developing world and exporting manufacturers to the, the developing countries. And that is problematic. Then I, I, I think it's necessary to move on to say that then why is this problematic? Right? That um, China, we know the great commodity boom results in for the first time in a long history, the, uh, the terms of trade improving for the commodity exporting countries and the massive deterioration of the terms of trade for China. And is in, this is in any events is not consistent with the unequal exchange. And the the North-South relationship is problematic because it's an unequal exchange. But in the case of China, can we definitely say that China exporting manufacturers, importing commodities from the European countries, is this really an unequal exchange? And we, only when we can confirm this, that we can say that China is causing problems and for the developing countries. And, Therefore, China is so-called imperialist or sub-imperialist. Thank you, Dick. Yes, Walter? Uh, yes, for, first of all, I, I see there's a lot of discussion going on in the chat and I haven't been able to follow it. So I wonder, uh, Sam Key, if there's some way that you could uh, preserve the chat and, and then allow and circulate it to us um, when the chat is complete. Okay, when I will try, yes. Okay, so back to a number of points. Um, just one more point to make about Xinjiang. We've heard reports of that, uh, I, I've reported on, on, on journalists who say things are very, are very bad for the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Others say they've, they've seen and heard other reports. One problem is that the Chinese government does not allow independent journalists into Xinjiang at this point. It does not allow communication between people in Xinjiang and the outside world. So that in itself, I think, is, uh, is evidence that the Chinese government has something to hide. But we, uh, one way to solve the problem of whose evidence is correct, whose facts are real and or fake, would be for the Chinese government to allow journalists in to check that out and, re and report. Journalists of whatever persuasion, but a perfect would certainly prefer those of leftists or, or Marxist persuasion. Um, and just one more point on the, the question of is China capitalist? I've, I said it before, but I think it's the essential point. In determining the class nature of, of society, uh, for Marx, the key question is, who produces the surplus and who captures the surplus? I think in China, there's no question that the surplus is, the surplus is produced by wage laborers, 
whether they are exploited or super exploited, and that the the surplus is captured by people who are seen as private capitalists or um, people who who are part of the state apparatus or whatever. But nevertheless, there is a class of people extracting the surplus value, capturing the surplus value that they extract from China's huge proletariat. And they're not all foreign imperialists. There are plenty of such people within China. Who are they? Uh, Marx pointed out that the history of, cla of the class struggles is always a history between a, 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 a ruling, a, a, sorry, a productive class and a ruling class. When the productive class is proletarian, the ruling class is almost by definition capitalist, even if it's capitalist in a different form. Marx pointed out that class societies, in particular capitalist societies, take have an infinite variety of forms. State capitalism or China's hybrid of state capitalism and private capitalism is one of those one of those varieties. Thank you. Otto, I saw that you raised your hand, but yes, just very quickly, please, just quickly. Yes, very fast, just trying to make everybody hate me. I would be categorical regarding letting journalists into Xinjiang as long as journalists and academic researchers are not willing to have a real comparative approach, I would say the Chinese government must not let them in, because as long as they don't do this, as long as they're not, not willing to really see the problem in Asia in its totality, as long as they only want to see Xinjiang, Tibet, etc., uh, they are doing China bashing and must not let them in because I saw the damage this has done in Tibet. I've spent three months there and years trying to understand this. Really, it's devastating. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very important contribution. Thank you for doing that. Um, I think Lo is still raising your hand. Okay, yes. Give the glow. Yeah, that's, that's a quick word, right? That I, I have seen so many self-labeled left, Marxist, socialist, critical, radicals, that they, they are portrayed of what has happened in Hong Kong is completely different from what I have seen personally, because I'm from Hong Kong. I see it as really a kind of local sovereignist, almost fascist movements, but, but then it has been portrayed by all kinds of self-labeled left to be progressive. So how can I trust? Or, well, not me, but I'm not important, but how can people trust that the self-labeled progressive radical masses, they are, they are truly they are true to their names? Thank you, Dick. thank you. Um, Liu, I think it's, um, yes, gave every speaker a chance to do the concluding remark so i would just invite you to just do the concluding one now oh thank you i didn't realize i have a chance uh, just want to talk about uh, personally uh, i'm from inner mongolia autonomous region which is another uh, region of ethnic minority and i personally have been to xinjiang and i that's why I find those accusations about Uyghurs and about the general sentiment against Muslims is very absurd. In my region and in the places I travel, uh, Muslims is a good name, good word. In Inner Mongolia, the Muslim is a good word. It represents honest business, clean food, uh, all the good things. Uh, that's, that's why I can when the journalists go to Xinjiang, can can they find does he or she find problems? Of course. If you find one case, two cases, ten cases, even hundred cases of oppression, does that mean Uyghurs are generally oppressed in Xinjiang? I think it's 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 more like logically it's like I found in the United States some cases of welfare are better than in China. I say it's a socialist country. I already I'm repeating my, my logic that it's quite absurd to use those cases uh, of problems to deny the entire, to, 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 accuse, to make an accusation of, and create an entire sentiment that China is oppressing 
figures in general. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. I think um, we have got a very strong rebuttal there. And um, it is the final panel of the China Working Group. Thank you again for staying with us till all this time and your participation. For the, to the speakers, you, you, your papers just make it a very rich um, panel. And also to the participants for your questions and discussion. Thank you very much. I hope that we will um, be able to um, continue a lot of these discussions, maybe not wait till another year for the conference. I will try to find ways to um, organize more online version, online discussion like this. I think it's useful. So um, please watch this space and um, subscribe to the YouTube channel so that you will be notified when we have um, uh, when we have and the upload of this event. And thank you again to everyone. So have a good evening and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thanks bye. for sharing this. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the whole thing. Bye. -bye. bye.